BBC Radio Lancashire with Martin James. Hello, Angus. Very warm welcome to another edition of At the Walker's Edge programme on BBC Radio Lancashire with me, Martin James. My guest this week is Dr. Paul Gaskell of the Wild Trout Trust. Britain has only one native species of trout, the brown trout, Selmo Tudor. It can only thrive in clean, well oxygenated rivers and lakes. It is as symbolic of bright waters as the kingfisher and the otter, as synonymous with an unsport landscape as a skylark and a wild rose. Pollution, increasing abstraction, and destruction of its habitat have long been driving the fish from its former widespread strongholds. Today, too often, even in remote places, only remnant populations cling on. Pollution and abstraction are both long-term problems requiring long-term solutions. Improvement to habitat, the physical environment in which the fish lives, feeds and attempts to breed can give benefit to the fish of today. Other benefits accrue to the wild flowers, insects, birds and animals that live on the surrounding land. In this practical, widely beneficial here and now habitat work that the Wild Trout Trust was founded to promote, though originally it was known as a Wild Trout Society, it has a respected voice in other forums. Recently, Paul Gaskell, the Programme Manager of the Wild Trout Trust, joined me on the River Ribble. As Paul was doing some aquatic kick insect sampling, he told me about the Wild Trout Trust. It's um, a small charity um, that has probably about 3,000 members, uh, and it focuses on the conservation of wild brown trout and the, the wider biodiversity and the wildlife associated with rivers. And the way that it goes about that is through habitat work um, and sort of direct uh, conservation measures um, rather than uh, being a political or a lobbying organisation that campaigns on behalf of these issues. So it's very much a hands-on and a direct action kind of a, an organisation. You talk about a charity, so how are you funded? Well, we're sustained by our um, membership. That gives us our kind of core of um, what you call unrestricted funds, so the kind of money that we can uh, appropriate as we see fit. Uh, But we also have quite a lot of uh, project-led funding for specific aims and specific activities. Uh, And this will tend to come from uh, either companies or some very generous support from fish and tackle companies like um, Orvis, uh, Hardy Grays and Sage, um, amongst others. Um, It's also very, very generously funded by the Environment Agency. Um, They offer us funding from the licence fee. So, you know, some proportion of the licence fee that anglers uh, contribute to actually ends up in going into this sort of um, direct habitat work that benefits our fisheries and also the the wildlife that uh, is associated with these fisheries. Um, And, yes, on other occasions as well, what we're trying to do is to... um, move into projects that some of the water companies um, might uh, contribute to as well. So uh, Seven Trent Water at the moment is looking uh, likely to be one of our funding partners um, to do some of the habitat works down in in, uh, areas of the country that they are sort of uh, active in. Um, So there's a whole suite of different funding streams really, but it is um, a not-for-profit, it's a charitable trust. Um, So all of the money that comes in is is appropriated um, towards direct habitat work. We're talking about wild trout, so we're talking about rivers and streams, and here in Lancashire and Yorkshire, Cumbria, we've got some delightful river trout fishing. Absolutely, and uh, it's, it's really kind of, um, you know, sort of areas of the country like this that are blessed with these uh, fisheries uh, and these sort of the rivers. Um, it's, it's about actually, I guess, um, educating people about the value of these, uh, these streams and the rivers, um, not only for their angling um, uh, sort of uh, characteristics, but also, again, the, the wider sort of importance to, uh, to nature as a whole. You know, this is really uh, the focus of all of the work that we do, um, is, is the, the sort of the wild streams and rivers, and also some of the hillocks and tarns as well that we have, uh, wild trout populations. It's becoming more fashionable and more desirable in, in many ways um, for people to, uh, to fish for the wild trout, uh, rather than um, the, uh, the challenge of, of fishing for stockfish. Uh, I think there is more value now placed on these um, wild populations of self-sustaining fish. Um, which is, uh, it's a good move and it's a nice move and I think it takes us away from um, the the philosophy that stocking is the answer to to good fishing because sometimes 
some of the monies that are won um, on the back of prosecutions for pollution incidents, um, there is a culture usually to, to, to um, put most of that money into to restocking the, the fishery by paying for stock fish, and that, this applies to coarse fisheries as well. Whereas oftentimes, you know, you could be better off to look at um, what the problems and the, the challenges are within your specific river uh, and to use some of that money to actually loosen up some of those bottlenecks. Uh, and you'll not only um, get a better fishery from your wild fish point of view, but you're also going to have uh, more chance of, of retaining any stock fish that are put in there as well. So, you know, it's, our aim is really to bring the habitat to the forefront of, of uh, considerations when looking at fishery and fishery quality. Today we're standing in the middle of the River Ribble. You've got a, a long-handled net and you're kicking the bottom. So what are you doing? Well, basically, it's, um, it's very similar to the technique that the Environment Agency would use to assess the, uh, the populations and the communities of the invertebrates in the river. Um, because if you have a good sample of that uh, invertebrate and bug population, uh, that tells you quite a lot about the water quality that uh, exists in the system. And it also tells you about the habitat quality as well. Um, the bigger range of different species of invertebrates that you have, uh, the better quality of the habitat and the better the water quality. Um, so there's a lot of information that, that invertebrate life can give you, and this is just a way of, of quickly and simply actually assessing that um, those population levels. Um, the thing about invertebrates, which is different from fish, is that they aren't really able to move away from pollution incidents. Um, so they have to complete their entire life cycle pretty much fixed in the one spot so they will respond very very quickly and they'll die off very quickly in response to pollution uh, and to poor water quality and to, to poor habitat quality um, so you know they're a very reliable and a very informative um, aspect of the river to, to sample. You talk about bugs but it's not only fish that rely on the bugs a lot of waterside birds rely on bugs including swifts, swallows, martins, dab chicks dippers, kingfishers, and a host of other wildlife around our riverbanks. Absolutely, and I think it's really important and something that probably most people don't realise is that there is um, a very, very tight link between everything that's going on on the bank side and the land surrounding the rivers. Um, the life within the rivers is kind of inextricably linked to, to, to that surrounding land as well. And these um, food webs... Um, uh, that exist within the river and in the wet part of the channel uh, are directly linked to, to the food webs that um, are, are um, existing in the surrounding land as well. So that, you know, for a healthy river corridor, um, the bankside uh, plants and animals need to be in a good state of affairs as well. And that's really why the Wild Trout Trust use the, the wild trout as, uh, as their icon because because it's a sensitive species and it requires good water quality and it requires this good um, habitat that is, is linked and is functioning, if you're managing and con conserving um, wild trout, then you're actually doing a pretty good job of managing for the wildlife uh, in the fields and the woods surrounding um, the, the river corridor as well. And talking about the bank side and talking about the plants, we have a very invasive plant, the Himalayan balsam. Yeah, and uh, again, this one of the uh, very, very common um, comments and technical inputs that we have when we go to um, fisheries uh, to advise them about how to manage their, their, uh, their rivers to the best effect. Uh, one of the issues there is invasive plants like Himalayan balsam, but also Japanese knotweed, um, that reduces the, the diversity of the bankside vegetation because it is so competitive and it shades out a lot of the, the existing plants. Um, and that provides less different types of habitat for the variety of insects that you'd normally find and that the trout feed on. The other thing as well with, with both um, Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam is that they, they die back in the winter. Uh, and because they've outcompeted and removed all the other vegetation, this leaves behind bare sandy banks that uh, the next flood that comes along washes all that sediment into the water and it clogs up the salmon spawning and the, uh, the trout spawning and the barbel spawning gravels um, all suffer because of that sediment input. So, you know, it's true to say that Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed um, kill trout and salmon and, and barbel.